Happy Lunar New Year! <laughs> My God, David, we're trying. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, we're, we're a couple days early, but happy Lunar New Year. <laughs> Hello everybody. Welcome to Hot Pot Talks. My name is Jen Sunshine and we are coming to you live from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. You might know us as the co-founders and co-artistic directors of Love Intersections, a media arts collective that produces documentary film about queer BIPOCs. We're also members of Value Co-op, the Vancouver Artists Labor Union Cooperative. In honor of Lunar New Year, the year of the metal ox, aha, um, <laughs> David and I came up with Hot Pot Talks to combine our love for hot pot and talking. This is a weekly series live streaming on YouTube and Facebook every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time where we have free-flowing conversations with artists, activists, chefs, performers, poets, and community organizers about what it means to be an artist facing today's realities, what ethical responsibilities do we have as artists, what organizing and art making looks like during quarantine, all the while sharing our favorite hot pot ingredients. Yeah, and so th thanks, Jen. And so why hot pot talks? Um, we, Jen and I um, are a part of, as Jen mentioned, Value Co-op, the Vancouver Artist Labor Union Cooperative, um, and we're we're a part of the Van uh, the community outreach uh, working group. Um, Value Coop has a unique no surpluses, no profits, no kickbacks model, and all of our profits go back into community collaboration projects that serve communities, um, and also back to um, employing artists. And we're really excited this year. Um, we are collaborating with our landlords. Our, so Value Coop Studio is in the Lim Sai Hor Cow Mock association building. It's a benevolent association building um, that was originally built in 1906 by the Chinese Empire Reform Society. The building has a lot of history um, and now it's inhabited by the Lim Association and uh, we're doing this uh, collaborative project called Engaging Chinatown where we're, where we're going to be digitizing their archives and then originally we were going to turn it into a visual, visual art ex exhibit, like an immersive visual art exhibit. But of course with COVID um, we've had to pivot a little bit. Um, um, and so uh, Hot Pot Talks is part of this um, intention of engaging Chinatown to connect um, the wider public, all of you watching, to um, issues that are happening in Chinatown. Um, as Jen mentioned, we're going we're to be talking to artists, we're going to be talking to activists, performers. Today we're going to be talking to a chef. Um, yeah, so we're super excited. Um, yeah, and just the idea of hot pot, um, the communal aspect of hot pot. We were thinking of hot pot as a metaphor of nourishment, thinking about culture as nourishment, thinking about Chinatowns as nourishment, um, how we can come to the table together um, to have these conversations around, around food and, yeah, food, fun, and conversation. So we so want to give a shout out. Oh, I'm sorry. To yeah. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> oh, we've never been so polite with each other. And we want to give a shout out to our incredible uh, practicum students who are working in the back end. Um, uh, David, do you want to introduce them? Yeah, we have amazing um, students from um, UBC Social Justice Institute. Um, they're uh, they're doing their practicum program with us. Um, Jessica and Cameron, who are doing all the tech back on the back end. So thank you so much, guys. Okay, so without further ado, we want to welcome Matt Murtawa, aka the Dumpling King. Welcome. Oh, <laughs> oh. we need to put him on. Hi, oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Matt. Uh, <laughs> I'm not driving. I'm not driving. I'm parked outside my kitchen. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm good. I feel like we're in um, what's it, James Corden's uh, carpool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> carpool karaoke i just got yeah, off seven. work so i'm i'm i found i found a quiet spot which is in my car and it's not in a kitchen because there's always clanging and and uh appliances being used so uh forgive yeah. me i do think i i was saying this earlier um that i think it's a missed opportunity i was gonna stage manage a little bit like you could have started out in your kitchen so we got a preview of what your kitchen looked like and then like bring us as like walking to your car because live then, tour and then yes exactly just break like, the fourth wall exactly <laughs> 
<laughs> um, maybe we'll start with the question that we started with last time. Um, Matt, t um, we, we shared, Claire shared with us, we, we started talking about our experiences with Hot Pot. What's your experience with Hot Pot and what's your favorite Hot Pot dipping sauce? Hot Pot has been always a, a family event. We didn't really go out to eat it that much. So it was always, I always associated Hot Pot with home and especially uh, my childhood and winter time. Um, uh, we would always overeat as always and it would last for hours and hours and we'd save the soup for the day, the, day ne uh, the next day. Um, but, you know, my very vivid memories with Hot Pot and distinct, and what you mentioned with this uh, dipping sauce, my favorite dipping sauce was something my grandmother used to make. And um, it's a memory of her go coming up the back stairs to our house with, um, I could hear plastic bags. And inside would be this Tupperware container filled with, I, it was like a mixture of soys and sugar and uh, vinegar. And it had tons mm. and tons and tons of chopped cilantro in it. And yeah. it was something which no one in my family recreated. No one asked questions mm. about it. It was just there on the table. And um, it's something which stuck with me and actually um, just sort of hidden in my memory. And it was actually a dipping sauce, which I matched with my dumplings on like my very first like pop-up event and I called it grandma sauce. Um, mm. So that's something which, um, that's my favorite dipping sauce is a, is a recipe which I think I've given out to you guys, but it's based on my memory and uh, my grandmother's past now, but uh, I did my best to recreate it. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. And what's and what's it? What's it? So it's cilantro. So it's cilantro. And, yeah, cilantro. Yeah. Cilantro stems. Uh, I, when I make it, there's a bird's eye chili in it, finely sliced. I use a little mm -hmm. bit of ketchup manis, which is uh, I think it's an Indonesian like sweet soy sauce because I like to like. Skip. Yeah, and uh, just a little bit of vinegar to taste. So soy, ketchup manis, uh, dark Chinese vinegar, a bird's eye chili, and like a whole bunch of cilantro, including the stems, finely wow. sliced. Uh, Amazing, refreshing, cuts yeah. through the the fattiness of the shabu shabu pork or the the beef. So, yeah, yeah, my favorite. Yeah, amazing. That sounds amazing. I, 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 I hmm. sorry, David. I no, I ahead. feel like cilantro is such an acquired taste. Um, I'm just actually really curious because as a kid. I hated cilantro. It tasted like soap to me. Yeah. Um, and I know that you can, there's certain enzymes or genes that. Yeah, there's just, a genetic, there's a genetic yeah. disposition for but, it to taste soapy. I, yeah, but then I grew to love it, but also because my parents were obsessed with it and it was so, it was specifically Chinese cilantro. And I didn't Very realize strong. that there was a difference between Chinese cilantro and like Western yeah. cilantro. Can you tell I us? I didn't this? know this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't know this. <laughs> What? Girl. It's the same with Chinese. <laughs> it's the same with Chinese celery versus like yeah. the yeah. Western yes. celery yeah. that we see. I mean, yeah. which are equally as delicious, but like Chinese celery is like the flavor. It's thinner, but the flavor is like times fifteen. Yeah. So like you use it in quite sparing mm. amounts. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, but so you're okay with cilantro now? You're I'm cool totally. I love cilantro now for some reason. I think I just it was an acquired taste. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I I love it. Growing up with me was also like dried shrimp. Like I just like couldn't stand like dried shrimp. And now I'm like all about it. I'm like, I, it's something yeah. which I have grown to love, so. Mm. That yeah. being said, yeah. I think because I, I, I grew to love cilantro because I associate it on a like olfactory sense. I associate mm -hmm. it with my parents. So yes. it may be possible that I'm just convincing myself that I love it based on childhood experiences and my childhood palate. Um, yeah, who knows, <laughs> David? It's delicious. Back to you, David. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so Matt, I just, so we first met because we have the same hairstylist. Yeah, Shout I haven't seen her in a while. I'm sorry, Kimiko, <laughs> if you're watching. <laughs> Forgive me. Kimiko, Kimiko Stella. Kimiko, she rules. <laughs> and, yes. uh, and, uh, we got well first of course you know and Kimiko and I are friends and she made your dumplings so then I started following you on Instagram and I noticed last year and this is how we got connected when we did that video with you there was a bit of a controversy where um people I guess in your community were mm. I guess sort of judging you for sourcing um ingredients in in Chinatown 
And so when I saw the sort of what was transpiring online, I was like, and at the time, you know, yeah. Jen and I had a uh, Love Intersections had an exhibit in Chinatown, and we were trying yes. to highlight different folks that were doing work in Chinatown, and and mm -hmm. this conversation seemed to be. Um, Kind of perfect for what was what was happening, and we so we invited you to to we interviewed you. Um, mm -hmm. Do you mind sharing a little bit about what happened, or or, or sure, that, yeah, that I mean, dialogue? yeah, absolutely. So, um, my business is ma I mandated my business to um, source as many greens as it can from Vancouver's Chinatown. So that involves the the, the soy sauces, the cooking wine, sugar, um, the the meat, especially the meat from a business that has been operating in there for probably 50 years now. So, um, yeah, and it was, um, I was very transparent. I mean, I've always tried to be as transparent as transparent, transparent as I can and where I source my ingredients, the, the behind the scenes of preparing food and what it's essentially like a experience in entrepreneurialism. So, um, yeah, there has been, there were about three isolated cases of just um, loaded comments about the quality of the ingredients uh, sourced from uh, my beloved butchers and implications that it was dirty and not that good and inferior. And, um, you know, I mean, I'm a different person now from when I was, you know, a year ago uh, to mm -hmm. two years ago. And, um, it just sort of, it upset me because it affirmed to me suspicions or things that I thought about what people thought of the food that I love so much and where I find it, mm -hmm. the ingredients mm -hmm. I find. Yeah. Can you and, be explicit? Uh, is, 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 it, is it, if I can just name it, is it the, is it the, like the racist undertones? behind I, I, <laughs> I don't think they're smart enough to realize it's racist <laughs> okay. um, but but that's the, this it, is but this is but it's in, it's embedded it's embedded mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. perceptions that uh food or ingredients that are processed by yellow hands mm -hmm. are inferior or just not worth the price that you ask for or so and so forth but these are implications which are um, internalized by Chinese communities and Asian communities that their own food is not uh, up to snuff, but also it's embedded into the fabric of the hierarchy of what we rate cuisines, techniques, products, anything from um, China, Chinese, mm -hmm. Hong Kong people, Taiwanese totally. people. And, and that, so, yeah, um, it, it, it was, it, it was, it landed as racist, but I don't think they're smart enough to realize it was. Right. Yeah. So. Well, you know, and I, I thanks, Matt, um, because, you know, I, it's always sort of one of the things that I've noticed also, right, it's also the sort of stereotypes of, of Chinese food too. Mm -hmm. And and of course, Chinese food, the evolution of Chinese food, and I'm not an expert on this, but the evolution Neither of am I. Neither in, am I. <laughs> in North yeah. America is this sort of the stereotype of it is it's, it's greasy and it's garbage, right? Mm -hmm. And it sort of erases this really rich history of the cuisine of how, you know, we were talking earlier about the, the techniques, the really, really challenging, refined techniques in Chinese food. But, you know, it, it gets sort of, um, it's in terms of the hierarchy, you know, it, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, all of the, the French food is like this, you know, yes. the, 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 the status, right? Whereas like, mm -hmm. when I look at like, even, um, I remember um, watching even like my grandma make noodles, for example, like the refinement. She tried to she, she tried to, to explain it to me, uh, you know, when I was younger, and it was like mm. the technique and the refinement is amazing, Ancestral. but it doesn't get held at the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I this is going to be a conversation, I think, regarding like the hierarchy of foods and questioning the, I guess. Uh, you can say like the classics. You can. What, it depends on which side you're talking from on the fence, right? Mm -hmm. If you're talking about classical food, you're talking about French, Italian, French and Italian essentially, and those are held in high esteem. I think because of the location we are in the world, in Vancouver and the Pacific Northwest, we have such a large population of Chinese people, mm -hmm. and the Chinese presence in this part of the world is is very very long. Um, I'm just sort of surprised that people still hold that view, especially in this part of the world. Um, but you know, 
Asian mm-hmm. people, Asian people do it. I'm just thinking like, they do. You know, it's, it's, I, yeah, it's, they internalize it as well. <laughs> It's the the whole like the the French thing in 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 Chinese um, culture pop popular culture right now. Jen, you and I have had this conversation too. There's like lineups outside of these like, you know. So it's it's interesting that it's also in internalized. In, well, I, in I think too. yeah, I think with something like um, French baked goods, there is like a romantic a romanticization. Yeah. Well, of it's that. Also, how it's marketed. It's how it's yeah. been marketed. They've had a longer chance to market it with a more receptive audience. If you think about it as a product to be exported. Um, yeah. Um, even within, I've noticed, like growing up, you know, even Chinese people, like even within the Asian collective of cuisines, it's uh, even for me. I've experienced that Japanese is like at the top as refined right. price point. Uh, you know, when you go into a restaurant, all these things, and Chinese is always like third or fourth. Mm-hmm. And I just, it's weird that we have we. We I self internalize that as well in mm-hmm. how I view the the cuisine of my of my culture of one of my cultures. So, um, yeah. Again, it, it just needs to be it's, educa- it's education. <laughs> okay, Matt, I'm dying to know why the dumpling king. Why? Yes. Oh. Can, you tell us the ed- can you tell us the etymology of the dumpling king? Etymology. <laughs> how you came to be? Um, so, how you came up with yeah, that name? Totally. What's your origin story? Um, so when I was, uh, when I started this company, it was actually my last names or my, my hyphenated last names. And I like, I, I marketed myself like that. And I first started marketing myself and doing private chef work. And I would always hashtag dumpling because I just would do these on the side. And I noticed that no one could pronounce my name. No one could remember my last name and it just didn't have any ring to it. So um, I started to make dumplings on the side just to sell to my friends. And I used to cook them at dinner parties for my clients. And I thought, you know, this is actually kind of a catchy name. I mean, it sounded kind of cheesy, but when you translate dumpling king to Chinese, it actually is like pretty epic sounding mm-hmm. like literally is like the king of dumplings. And I was like, well, that's pretty boss. <laughs> and I just ran with it. And it was just sort of became this sort of like this like avatar of everything that I wanted to be. Like, I don't want to be too abstract, but it like just sort of bio, uh, organ- bio, organically became this like aspect of me, which I wanted to be. Does that, it's, is that, it's, yeah. Yeah, is that too it's, abstract? Is that no, too meta? We, 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 love, we love meta. We love abstract. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Artists. So I just started hashtagging it and I was like, whoa, the people are like paying attention to me more because I'm like using a different name. And like, here I am, <laughs> like six years later, like still making dumplings every bloody day. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, can yeah. you tell us a little bit about how you grew up, where you grew up, and what your family mm-hmm. is like? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I grew up in in Vancouver. Uh, I went to a high school. I grew up on the west side of the city. Um, I, you know, my father's from Hong Kong, and he immigrated from Hong Kong to Victoria to go to boarding school in the '60s. So he was like the second Chinese uh, at his boarding school, and wow. he met wow. my mother, uh, who was. Uh, from Victoria and her parents are very, very English. And <laughs> uh, and they met and so they moved to Vancouver and I and that's where I was born. So I have a sister uh who is moving back here who has I have a little nephew. And um yeah and so ch- the identity of being Chinese and, and being in touch of that aspect of myself was very apparent to me. Like I, I wasn't isolated from Chinese people growing up in Vancouver because there's just so many. Uh, that mm-hmm. immigrated over in the 50s and 60s and continued to. Um, so um, it was always something which was in front of me, I could engage with, but I couldn't find a connection to a certain way to it. And I found that it was through food. And um, mm. it kind of feels like this business is just like a continual, like linear experience of my engagement with Chineseness and mm-hmm. asserting myself through food. That's so cool. thanks. Um, I'm so because I think this is. I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think probably your most famous flavor is the Johnny Walker black dumplings. Mm. Um, can you tell me? I'm just because I'm I'm a, a bit of a food nerd. Can you just tell me how did you how did that how did you come up with that? Or if you can share what's yeah, how did you come up with that? Because it, it it tastes amazing. Can I be real? 
just be real for yes. a second. <laughs> yes. I was I was so baked in my kitchen. <laughs> and I was like I was just I was I was fussing about and I was just, you know, you know, you vibe just like any type of creative person. You're just you're running through uh technique you're thinking about you know you're anticipating and all these things and i was just to be honest really baked and i had these ingredients in my kitchen i remember <laughs> like there was uh, there was an aha moment uh obviously the first drafts were not particularly good just like any craft <laughs> but it was just a matter of what i had in my kitchen the the st- like i always have worcester sauce i always have vinegar i always got a little bit of whiskey and yeah. it was just sort of like what was there and just like vibing and then through years and months and weeks of just um dialing it in so i'm trying to sort of like yeah. talk myself out of just like a, um an inebriated mistake uh, but, <laughs> no. but that's that's just, that's what i did and like you know it it's um it's changed it changed the trajectory of my life like i'm here talking to you yeah. about something yeah. that i made six years ago and I just well, like, yeah. did it every day, every day until people are like, you're going to like this. You got to buy this off. <laughs> so here I am. Well, because yeah. it, it feels to me like the magic is what is what was what create was created through sheer luck. You you say inebriated mistake. Um, I, I say it's a combination of um, all of the things that you talked about uh, because yeah. you, you got into a flow with it. Um, yeah, you know? I, I'm not selling it. I'm not selling it as best that I should. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wanted to create something which, because I wanted to create something that was approachable to people and mm-hmm. um, an approachable, delicious item that I could repeat and perfect and everybody would be receptive to it. Mm -hmm. Um, my goal has always been, and for the rest of my life will be to study, cook, read and write about Chinese food. And this was like something that I made and I was giving them out samples out to people like, this is really good. I'm like, well, you know, I think I'm honestly, so I just chased it and, um, and then here we are. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is sort of, I mean, that's one of the reasons, I mean, I think people are drawn to your branding too, is because there's something just cheeky and also unpretentious and it's also just really fucking good oh can i swear that's yeah. too late it's our it's our show it's our show you we can do whatever we want <laughs> thank you <laughs> and part of me and, and and going back to that thank you for enjoying my product and you're such a strong supporter and like i remember coming to soap with kimiko and like partying and having fun. <laughs> I, I remember you um and like mm. part of me was an aspect to that, to this journey and entrepreneurialism and self, you know, self-actualization, all these abstract terms, just like trying to make a living is like seeing the affirmation of like my Chinese peers and like their parents and mm-hmm. the CBC, Hong Kong, Taiwanese, uh, CBC community, like actually see value in what I do and actually believe that like this guy can make a dumpling. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like it's, they're, they're ubiquitous and yeah. it's very hard yeah. to sell people on like a very good dumpling because there's so many and we live in such a, we live in a part of the world where they're everywhere. And, yeah. you know, you enter the market with this, you enter the, 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 sorry to talk business talk, but like you enter the market with like a higher price item with like high quality ingredients using ingredients that are from the city around you. And, mm-hmm. you know, for people to believe in that. And especially, like I said, Chinese people to be like, this is good stuff. Like that's like, you know, that makes me want to keep making more in itself. Yeah. Um, it's an affirmation that I could, that's the highest form of affirmation that I could want. Yeah, honestly, Matt, I was a little bit jealous because since I was like 19, I was like, I remember going for dim sum with my friends and I was like, guys, wouldn't this be like dim sum style food? Wouldn't this be so good with like a cocktail? <laughs> and then so when the soap thing came and now of course this yeah. other establishment totally. have it, I was like, this is what I want for Saturday night. Yeah. Was like. 
a plate of amazing dumplings and like yeah. an amazing cocktail, you know? Listen, I've always said that David in an alternate uh, parallel universe, parallel timeline, David is a restaurateur. He's the one who is decorating the restaurant. He's, he's the one who's managing the like- the image. Don't be a restaurateur, be a consultant. <laughs> like, yeah. Be a consultant. <laughs> he lives for this stuff, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Matt, I'm wondering if um, I could, because there's just, I'm so glad there's more conversations now around, because like food, especially like culturally mm -hmm. um, specific foods, like for example, with Chinese food, I think the conversations around MSG is finally coming to light that it is no yeah. longer this unhealthy thing. Cancer. Um, cancerous <laughs> yeah. thing that in fact there's science behind it. It's, it's umami, it's found totally. naturally bodies. I'm just wondering if you can tell us more about what's emerging in your industry and what are some insights you can share? Um, again, it's a polarizing racialized issue and okay. anybody who argues otherwise is like there is a racialized dimension to that ingredient. Um, mm -hmm. like, like, I'm not against it. I love MSG. It's in Pringles. It's in your favorite potato chips. Uh, I think there is a, there is a there is a a response to that in the food business. I mean, Vancouver sort of a to be honest, Vancouver is kind of a backwater for a lot of like food trends. Like we receive a lot of trends from the states and, mm. and Europe, but but overall, I mean, there's very outspoken people in the larger global food community that say MSG is great, and um, and there's a lot of people that have that old attitude that it's gives you what is it, like sweats or makes your heart like beat faster um mm -hmm. the conversation is opening up more but again there's always going to be people that think that anything that is touched by chinese or asian hands mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. not as good or dirty or blah 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 so uh, let's yeah. just say that it's like the conversation is being continued the fact that people are talking about and addressing it and like if people like oh msg like if you're at a dinner table and you're like ew i don't want to eat msg a couple people at that table will be like i don't think it, i don't think you're correct about that man right so that mm -hmm. to me is progress um obviously you're you are entitled to your opinion i suppose but um opinions aren't facts so mm. well said yeah yeah i have a it's a slightly off question but um like i Please. i've been I'm, I, it's a question about gender and the mm. food industry. I was really struck by, mm -hmm. like I come from, like my, my dad's a really, um, he, he's the one who sort of inspired me to even just learn how to cook. And I remember watching, um, and you know, I watch a lot of food shows and you see this sort of very, how do I say it? Like a kind of bro-y um, culture that I see on TV anyway, right? And I remember yeah. watching this episode, I wa watching this episode of, um, I think it was Chef's Table, and it was this um, queer woman in LA mm -hmm. who was this amazing. She was an amazing chef, and mm -hmm. she was talking about her her challenges, kind of breaking through in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, into the point where she literally saw a food critic come in and was raving about the food, and then saw her in the kitchen, and then sent it something back or something like that, and to the point where she would remove her name from the from the you know try to or, de or gender neutralize her her name or or whatnot in, in her Absolutely. marketing yeah i'm wondering and this is i'm totally not in the industry <laughs> at all yep. does is I'm, I'm just thinking about these conversations that we've had around like the 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 pretension the pretentious yes. culture around and policing around like where is the the you know the who is the holder of the expertise yeah, who's the gatekeeper who gets made, who, yeah, yeah. who should be, whose work should be valued, who should be paid more for their work, mm -hmm. all that yeah. stuff. Um, yeah. To be quite honest, um, I've spent the, I felt very fortunate to spend most of my experience in the food industry being self-employed. Um, but I have worked in kitchens. I worked in like as a line cook for about two years. Um, that it, it, it's all case by case, but mm. your perception and the, the 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 evidence you see of like bro culture does exist are just broiness but again there's like let's like unpack that because like there's like different yeah. levels of bros like i look like a bro and like sometimes like i'm self-conscious that i like look like a bro too much and like, <laughs> like i think that like 
there's like different aspects to like being um to the to what being a bro is uh like there's a lot of bros in my kitchen they're super inclusive and fun and friendly and willing to help anyone that comes across so um i think that it's still very 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 apparent um and i was i feel like i was targeted as well because i am not like those people Mm -hmm. um so it's like it, it spares no one everybody loses in that culture right um yeah. but um i've been very fortunate to see a lot of environments in restaurants and especially in this kitchen that i work out of where that's a zero tolerance of behavior zero tolerance right. um so yeah yeah it's a work well, in progress love- <laughs> it's a work yeah. in progress yeah totally well, so it's why again. I mean, I just love the cheekiness of you know the the, the idea of the dumpling king, right? It sort of oh, yeah. turns a lo- turns a lot of that on its head. I think. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, <laughs> I, I'd like to think that the brand has matured in the last like <laughs> like couple years. Like, I'm not as um, I'm not as uh, like showy as I used to be. Um, but I'm sorry, I just turned my car on. See, I'm, oh, no, yeah, yeah, no. Stay, stay, I'm stick with the natural light. Stick with the natural light until you absolutely have to. Sorry. Um, <laughs> car, car, car light. I hope you guys are yeah. entertained. Um, <laughs> Stage <yeah>. man. <laughs> um, You're great. The brand is, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, like, right now, I feel like, yeah, the, the brand, like, you have to change with the times like any creative person. Uh, you evolve, you mature, uh, certain things are placed on priority. Like the beginning of my brand was just, or when I first started this business was just to assert myself that I was qualified to cook this food and that I should be mm. compensated for this amount. Um, right. and that's just proving yourself year in and year out and just not going anywhere, having staying power. Um, yeah. but, um, you know, there's always a little bit of irreverence, uh, as that's just sort of who I am. But, um, you know, now it's more about getting the food out to more people and communicating a message of like pride and inclusivity and intersectionality through food, um, through Mm -hmm. like a very simple uh, food item. So do you think people are ever surprised when they see you and judge you based on your external kind of image and then hear you talk about intersectionality and all of these like really incredible social justice issues. Um, do they ever get a little surprised by that? Yeah, I guess <laughs> yeah like I, I masquerade as a bro. I mean, I'm, yeah. a, <laughs> um, but you know, uh, there are, there, of course, there's some people who have, uh, who are taken back, but um, let's just move past that. Like, you know, like I've, I've, I'd like to think that I've, I continue to, put my money where my mouth is and do what's best for um, exporting my, um, how much I value the culture that I'm a part of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm curious, um, I have another food question. Is there is there a, a, an area of Chinese cuisine that you're exploring right now or yeah. interested in? Yes, very much so. Um, so I, Chinese food blows my mind. Like I can't stop. <laughs> I can't stop eating it. I can't stop looking at it. I can't stop watching like YouTube, like passive cooking, chopping content. Like I'm yeah. all about it. Um, I'm, I'm re-delving into or getting into Sichuan food. And that is a style of food, which I wasn't exposed to a lot uh, growing up. My father's from Hong Kong and his parents immigrated from the mainland from uh, Zhejiang and Jiangsu province. So the food from there is very mild, um, sweet, and as well as Cantonese food. So I didn't grow up eating like lots of chilies, uh, you know, the mala, like Sichuan peppercorns and like all these different um, cooking techniques which are and flavor profiles which are different from the region of China and Hong Kong, um, which I grew up with. So I'm really sort of like delving into um, mm-hmm. Sichuanese cuisine and I have like my homework set for me over the next like year and I'm going to start looking into Hunan cuisine as well like spice so and how how to master and yeah my grandfather's uh, from Hunan Hunan Hunan. yeah Yeah. spicy spicy. very so spicy like Hunan people think that Sichuanese people are wusses I know I know (laughs) what yeah oh my goodness so yeah 
So, so yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm learning more, um, you know, I'm sort of trying to cook uh, on my own time, these sort of old classic Sichuan uh, uh, dishes and just sort of explore mm. that. Cause when I did go to Sichuan, I got food poisoning and I was in bed for oh, like no. two days. And then I like was at a Chinese, a Sichuanese Chinese opera like the day before I left, like with the cold sweats. So, um, so I, I'm sort of trying to relive like my lost time when I was in Chengdu, uh, and like cook a little bit from home in Vancouver. But, uh, like I said, being in Vancouver, you have access to yeah. so much, so many ingredients, which are so hard to get a hold of. And so many Sichuanese ingredients that you mm -hmm. wouldn't find anywhere else, which you can be, can be found in Vancouver, which is pretty cool. Yeah, one of the things that I we did this is obviously pre-COVID, and it's one of the the most amazing like culinary things that if you want to call it that is we we used to do a uh, Richmond food court tours. Oh yeah, in like those, those like yeah. oh my goodness, like and it, it, in like yeah. the it, like the sort of weird not like the big the big malls, but there's also like yeah. little like working malls, and just like like those $5. low key hype malls, those low key hype malls. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness, we it Crystal was so just. Mall. Yeah, yeah. Oh, amazing people. you know yeah. just and you would we would spend like 40 dollars, and we would just eat the most incredible i mean my mouth would mostly be burning off because I'm, again i'm yeah. not used to eating those types of chilies yeah but. you're you yeah the, you have a your cantonese palate right and so do like that's yeah. what i grew up eating and so like it's like too much like it's an overload right um but yeah yeah so we're so that's lucky a, a to live in vancouver yeah, a funny, just a side note on the spicy. We went to this one of the sauerkraut fish place in Richmond. Oh my god! And yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my god! So I, I came prepared. I came with a, a towel, okay, a, a, an actual towel. And I see, so I'm like sweating away. We're like yeah, you put around your neck. Like, <laughs> and this like seven year old child yeah. was like literally just like snacking on the chilies yeah, you yeah. know like just no problem and i'm like just like sweating buckets like yeah. just trying to get through the course <laughs> i went for a, yeah. i went for a one in richmond this barbecue place in richmond and they have them on the the skiers and i yeah. we would go in the summertime i put a towel around my neck because i'm sweating and like i'm just not yeah. used to the heat and hopefully through this my Sichuanese self-study um yeah I could grow some tolerance to it because it's quite embarrassing. So I'm like, I, I, my, like my stomach hurts. I have to stop. So, yeah. can I ask a serious question? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please. It sounds very who, ominous. To, to, to who? Ominous. To who? To who? <laughs> to, to you, Matt. Uh, it sounds very ominous. It's not. Um, and you can pick which one. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll include a fun one. A fun one sure. would be. Um, if you have a favorite like utensil to cook with, I think like everyone has like a favorite oh. spatula. Like I have my favorite spatula and it's like V1. And yeah. um, I also have a favorite, like I like spoons. I don't like forks and knives. Like I'm very particular mm -hmm. about my utensils. Um, mm -hmm. I know that like I follow this chef, um, John Kong on TikTok and um, he exclusively prepares, he's also a chef, obviously, um, and he exclusively prepares with a cleaver only. Um, you know, those like Asian, giant Asian butcher, the cleaver. Yeah, I yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, I just, I've always, I'm always really impressed by people who have a particular like style in their mm. um, way of preparing things in the kitchen. Um, yeah, I'm just curious if you if you have that. So that's the not less serious question. The the more serious question is um, there's two. Sorry, I'm asking a lot of questions yeah, now. Yeah. But so I'm curious. Taking notes. The, the two serious questions are <laughs> one: there is um, a lot of conversation around cultural appropriation as it relates to food, mm. and I'd be curious. Mm. I'm curious about your experiences with that. The second mm. serious question is. Um, uh, obviously, in the like food and beverage industry and the kind of overarching service industry, there's a lot of like drug and alcohol abuse, you know, because mm. of the like hours and the just night and day mm. kind of um, yep. working styles and stuff. It's very prevalent. And mm -hmm. um, I'm just, yeah, I'm curious if there's any insight from you. Sure. On that. That's your first question. My favorite utensil <laughs> is a CCK cleaver. I have a oh, Okay. Wow. Oh. So yeah, those are my favorite ones. Um, either uh, carbon or stainless. Those are my favorite. Yeah. And I've always been super impressed. Uh, it was just a way to, it was like, 
just like chefs and cooks with like their egos and their like tattoos yeah. just trying to like yeah. ident- i should like, show their like identity through like the tools they use so like that's always been like my dad always used to cleaver at home um and i was always impressed going to the barbecue places how they would wield that they have a command of such a large blade and can yeah. do such precise cutting and um that's my favorite cleaver that's or that's my favorite knife rather um yeah. uh and it always forever shall be so yeah um, is that the on, name of is that the name of the brand sorry to interrupt yeah I'm CCK. In, in the okay i'm in the market yeah, for tun- cleaver. <laughs> uh, my, my pronunciation isn't very it's tun zi, uh which is like a cck which is a tun zi gay which is in hong kong it's on okay. Okay. Shang- shanghai street you can get them at tinland right next to my butcher uh, go to Tinland oh. and see one of the see one of the staff there, and they import them directly from Hong Kong. So, oh, you know, amazing! So yeah, you can get them there. And I've a couple amazing. of um, my customers have asked where I get them, and I, send, I always send them to Tinland. You can it's right amazing. in China. Yep. yep. <laughs> Sorry, the second uh, question. They, yeah. <laughs> a ser- well, the serious question. The serious questions only if you want to answer them. Oh, of course. Um, so the second, what was the second question? The, serious, well, the first one first was serious. around uh, like cultural, cultural appropriation. appropriation, around food. Yeah. yeah, totally. Um, cultural appropriation. <laughs> <laughs> just because our audiences would love to hear about. Yeah, this. totally. Well, and then um, if, if I may just quickly add to, because I'm, I'm, I want to also mm-hmm. ask because this is part of my question around the the Johnny Walker. Dumpling is this, it is this fusion. There's the, the yeah. this fusion of food that tastes amazing too. So it's this. Thank you. Do, yeah. we, do, we, like this, what, do we like that word? Do we like fusion anymore? Still? Is it an okay word? Yeah. Is it an okay word to you? It's, 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 oh my God. Yeah, this is like, it's, there's so many levels to food and like food is something, food, money, these are things people take very, very, very personally. So when you comment on people's food, if you mess with people's food, you mess with people's money, they get very, very rightfully upset. And mm-hmm. food is identity. Food is so many things. Um, regarding the cultural appropriation thing, it just like seems like there's like a revolving door of just like ill-informed individuals and companies and organizations uh, using it, using other people's cultures or symbolisms or iconography for commercial gain. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very hard to believe a large corporation or uh, or um, on their intentions when using uh, appropriating borrowing. It's a slippery slope. Um, again, like that was something, even though that I am Chinese, um, it was something that I worried about because I don't present, like, I don't like, what does a Chinese person look like? What does this, you know, you know what I mean? That like yeah. cyclical, cyclical questioning. So that to me was uh, something that I was worried about when I put my face out there to market the mm-hmm. product I make. Like and you, were being, you afraid people would call you out? Yeah, a little bit. They're yeah. like, you don't know anything about this. How dare you do this? Yeah. And so yeah. part of, yeah. part of my, asserting my Chineseness and my knowledge and reverence for my culture mm-hmm. is through, you know, the writing that I, the, some, some of the, the journalistic writing I did, the recipes, the, you know, sharing aspects of my life and uh, having it resonate with other people who had similar experiences. So um, cultural appropriation is like this, you know, like the calling out and calling in kind of mm-hmm. thing. It's like, it, it's all case by case, but ultimately like it's becomes this like, like free for all of just, um, I can understand why people get upset when, when yeah. I get upset when I like the Mahjong line, like, like, oh yeah. my God, like that's like the most recent thing that happened. And among a, like, a series of things that have, that have happened on the internet yeah. since then. But, um, it is all case by case. Like, for example, like someone who I respect tremendously and like reminds how little I know about Chinese food is an English woman named Fuchsia Dunlop. Mm-hmm. And she's a, mm. she, she um, went to a chef school in Sichuan. Yeah. And she's English. Yeah. And she's, she's white. Mm. Yeah. But like no one calls her out for cultural appropriation because she's done the work. 
Yes. And she truly reveres and is a student of the game. Yeah. So right. it's all case by case. Most of the time, it's appropriation. Some of the yeah. time, it's just like an angry mob going in the wrong direction and targeting mm-hmm. the wrong person. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. it's a it's a it's a tricky subject. You know, uh, and you Matt, you also brought up this you know this this the imposter syndrome thing for people, especially in the diaspora too. Yeah. You know, like I I'll t- I'll tell this story, Jen. I told you today. I had this embarrassing moment where. I so I didn't know that Iron Buddha tea is Tit Gunyam. I thought it was some I you know I always see that the it, it being sold in places, but I thought it yep. was some like hippie white people thing. Yeah, dude, <laughs> dude, like, do you know how many times that's happened to me? Like I'm like, am I Chinese enough? I don't know what that means. Like, oh my god, like I was I've been so like, out, like, I'm too white. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and that's another thing to talk about. It's like, yeah, I, I'm I with was, you, dude. Yeah. I went, yeah, I went to this tea place and I was like, oh, do you have tikkun yum? And they're like, that's Iron Buddha. I was like, oh my God, Iron Buddha is tikkun yum. It's literally my favorite dim sum tea. Yes. <laughs> so I felt like, like, I felt like such an imposter. <laughs> yes, I feel that all the time. Like I'm going to be called out for something. It's just, like, mm-hmm. you're not Chinese enough. Or like, you don't know that saying. Or, like, But I think that just saying that amongst like Chinese diaspora, because like we are, we're being subjugated. To, we're, we're, we're subject to all different types of culture and changing times. And like, we're, yeah. we're born in Canada. So like, we know, we know Chinese or Canadian cultures, which, and mm-hmm. sayings and, and terminologies that people in Hong Kong or China might not know. So it's, it goes both right. ways, but I'm with I you mean, on that. And that's the thing too, because everyone assumes that I was born in Canada, just based on my outward presentation. And- yes and how I speak, um, but mm-hmm. every once in a while, my ESL slips out, I, my accent slips out, um, but you know, I was born in Taiwan and I um, was there for nine years, so I didn't speak English growing up, but the assumptions that people place therefore on me based on my you know, appearance and, my, and their perception of me is often very hurtful, but I also understand um, why they would go to those assumptions as well, because um, David yeah. and I talk about this at length um, when we engage with our own kind of artistic practice and our own work. When it comes down to the kind of the identity of Chineseness, um, we uh, you know we're constantly talking about how um, insecure we are. At least I am, you know, because I don't fit the norm and conform to those expectations. You know, and I've always prided myself on being an, an outsider in so many ways. Um, but with that comes with um, so many, so much self doubt as well. Um, yeah. yeah. How nice it must be to feel belonging to a giant collective and look and feel like everybody else. How how how, <laughs> lucky, they, how lucky they must feel. Well, and, and that's <laughs> the thing. It's that, so I respect collectivist cultures tremendously because I think mm-hmm. that there is merit in mm, the two, the a hybridity of the two, you know, like Eastern, mm-hmm. um, let's say Asian countries, East Asian countries are for the most part collectivist cultures here mm-hmm. in the in Western countries is for mm-hmm. the most part individualistic cultures. And I think like people of the diaspora really can navigate that hybridity and bring both um, and, and navigate both. Um, and when people assume things like uh, assumptions, and we, you know, you, you can't blame anyone for their assumptions. But um, like the notions of like how saying how oh, there's like let's unpack bro, but there's like let's unpack Chinese. Yeah. Like, there's so yeah. many levels of like what does that mean to different people? Like you were born in Taiwan. Like mm-hmm. the definition right. of what Chinese is isn't necessarily nationally. It's ethnic. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then, right. when you unpack the ethnicity, it's like, well, what is ethnically Chinese? Is it Han? Right. Is mm-hmm. it Hakka? Is it? I'm half you know, Hakka, so technically. There you go. Yeah. You know what I mean? And there's so there's yeah. such hyper yeah. regionality from China, and yeah. like even Chinese people is like, I don't really know what I like. Am I this? Or am I that? Right. Mm-hmm. And there's on top of the nationality of Canadian, yeah, Hong Kong. Yeah. Do you, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you have these conversations? I know we're like getting dark. Here, right? I'm getting very dark. Yeah, I'm just seeing. I'm, but I'm very I'm moody. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Ambiance is lovely. I'm. I'm. Lo- I'm, yeah. I'm it because, uh, yes, it's it's different. Um, Matt, I'm curious if you have these conversations with your parents, um, especially because you're a mixed race, and mm-hmm. you know what? What are your parents' experience like? Surely it's well. You know, 
you know, Chineseness was defined by myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I because my father's Chinese, I carry that name. Uh, like I, uh, it was the name that I I was Matthew. Wu. I just I took out the hyphenate because it's just too long to write growing up. So I was always looking like I'd write my name, but I wouldn't look like a Chinese. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, the way we we experienced culture wasn't so active in the sense that, like, I was witnessing how Chinese people behave with the way he would interact with my aunties and uncles and, you know, family visiting from out of town and going to Hong Kong. It was just, like, a given that that's what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, but the actual, like, explanation of, like, why do we do these things, the genealogy and the history behind all these things and where my my father's side came from was research that was done on my side um which is something which was a yearning to learn more and to affirm to myself that i had like a right to exercise and assert that identity um and that came through you know traveling it's almost like i put in the footwork you know like that's why i have a degree in chinese history that's why i Mm -hmm. i moved to taiwan and i studied you know mandarin there and i traveled through mainland china and i've returned to taiwan many times after it's um, oh, I've gotten so dark. Yeah, I think it's time to put that light on. <laughs> Should we? I'm just wondering. It's it's getting time. I'm yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. So, do, what do you guys? Um, if you have, well, maybe I was going to say if you have any Lunar New Year plans, but we you probably don't. What's your favorite Lunar New Year tradition? Aside from obviously. Hot pot. <laughs> oh, money. <laughs> money. David, yeah. David's is obviously money. Jen is yeah. obviously hot pot. Sorry, value caught. We're supposed to be anti capitalist. Right. So yes. I should probably yes, stop David. that. Stop that. <laughs> <laughs> but what's your favorite uh, Lunar New Year tradition? Mine? Well, it was, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm an audience. I really like getting money. You really what? Yeah. I have to give it. But, I liked really liked receiving a ball, but I'm I'm yeah. married now, so I need to give it. But You're married right. now, okay? So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think okay. right yeah. Now. I didn't know you were married. Why didn't we talk about this? <laughs> <laughs> I know. So my my siblings are being that's so. Another, um, that's another hot dog. Okay. Okay. We'll save, this for, <laughs> we'll save this for next time. I'm so curious. I'm also super curious about your travels. Like we we didn't get into any of that. Yeah, my I was gonna say my siblings are being very. Yeah. I was gonna say my my siblings are being very cheeky with me because I'm also married now. But they're like, you can't get you can't get out of this because you, you're technically you're supposed to come over to someone's house and then you give them a red pocket. But they're like, I you can still e transfer. You can still e transfer. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're losing. We're losing some visibility. I think it's time to wrap up. Um, Matt, thank you so much for you know spending this hour with us in your car <laughs> of all places. Um, this is the first for us, so thank I'm glad. You for <laughs> being in my car. Oh yeah. No, it, it it's all good. Hey, Claire was in her bathroom. You're in your car. <laughs> I feel like I feel like our our next guests have to have like you know some uh, competition. <laughs> so should we announce? Exactly. Thank you to the door too. We can't really hear you, uh, Matt. Your audio my, isn't my coming through. <laughs> Um, okay, well, let's say good night then. Um, David, do you want to intro- uh, just give a shout out for the next week's guests? Bye. Yeah. Bye, Bye Matt. Yeah, so, Thank you so much. Bye, Matt. Thank you. Um, so next next week we have um, Amanda. Oh, <laughs> next week we have Amanda Hyun um, and two Value Co-op members, uh, Annie Canto and uh, Nura Ali, who are going to be co-hosting, co-guesting with us. Um, Amanda's also one half of Edible Projects, and they do like food design. They're based right now based in Brooklyn. Um, Nura's in Calgary. Annie, uh, Jen, and I are here. So it's going to be a multi-geography 
multi-spatial <laughs> conversation. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm very excited for that one. Um, I'm sweating through because I was so nervous um, because Matt was in his car and I was like, this was just too many variables. Like people could be knocking on the windows, the bus could be coming by, audio issues. And his phone dropped at one point when we were doing the soundtrack. It was chaotic, but if I- you can, If you can tell, we're filmmakers. <laughs> <laughs> we have so we need to issues. control. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good. Yeah. So All yeah, right. that, that's next week. And then the following week um, is Kai Cheng Tom, who is my cousin. We're very excited to have her on board. Uh, cool. Well, why don't we just give a preview of everyone else? Who Who's after Kai? Oh, well, they don't have this in One, so, Yeah. So um, next week is Nura Ali Amanda. The following, following week is Kai Cheng Tom. Um, the week after that is the Aya Collective um, in Edmonton. In, mm-hmm. in Edmonton. Mm-hmm. Um, they do work in Edmonton's Chinatown. And then we have Karen Tam. Karen right now has an exhibit at the Griffin Gallery called Who's Chinatown? Um, she's a Montreal based in... artist. Um, she also has a Wikipedia page if you're curious. That's on March 10th. And then March 17th is T Base based in Toronto. Who are we getting from T Base again, David? Uh, Han- Hania and Jay. Yeah. yeah. And then on the 24th for our last one is uh, Tao Li Goff, um, oh, who's sure. an amazing, who's a PhD DJ um, and a Cornell professor. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, benevolent associations, China, uh, Chinatowns, um, and uh, some of her work doing um, Afro Asia encounters. So we're super yes. excited about and all of our panel. Yes, I'm very excited about that one. Okay, yeah. have a good night, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, so everyone. See you next Wednesday. <laughs> Bye.